In 1995, Donald Wayne Foster, a professor of English at Vassar College New York, made a startling case for Shakespeare's being the author of a newly discovered 578-line poem, called A Funeral Elegy. Foster in the 1990s had come to the conclusion, that W.S. and William Shakespeare were one and the same person, because he had found indisputable evidence that the funeral elegy is partly formed from textual and linguistic fabric, indistinguishable from that of canonical Shakespeare. Foster's attribution went not unchallenged, however. In 2002 a French scholar, Professor Gilles de Munser at, University of Burgund, Dijon, France, proved, beyond any reasonable doubt, strong contextual connections of the funeral elegy to the largely unknown English poet, John Ford and his literary works, Christ's Bloody Sweat, and The Golden Mean, both 1613, and others. In June 2002 in a stunning development, that has set the world of Shakespeare scholarship abuzz, Professor Foster admitted publicly, he was wrong. In a message he wrote, that another poet and dramatist, J. F., that is John Ford, was the more likely author of the poem. He stated, No one who cannot rejoice in the discovery of his own mistakes deserves to be called a scholar. Because of a deplorable neglect or denial of a contemporary Shakespeare Marlowe authorship problem. Foster and Munserat, both orthodox Stratfordians, obviously seem to have been unable to imagine a plausible unifying solution of the bizarre controversy. W.S. or J.F. Foster and Munserat were right and wrong at the same time. They were right, because the text and context are obviously from one and the same single author. They were wrong, not recognizing in W.S. and J.F. different initials of pseudonyms the author used over time, for different works and book genres. It is conspicuous that in February 1612, Thomas Thorpe, T.T., entered, a funeral elegy, in the stationer's register. The same publisher, who had registered Shakespeare's sonnets, 
three years earlier, in 1609. There are strong intrinsic arguments, that a funeral elegy, by no means can have been written about an unknown William Peter, as it is indicated on the title page. The victim, referred to in the title of a funeral elegy, a 29-year-old William Peter, deadly stabbed into the brain, after a quarrel, corresponds to Marlowe's age and to his alleged, most rare cause of death. Metaphorically Marlowe revealed, without the risk of self-endangerment his personal life tragedy and his concealed motives, by hiding behind a true contemporary incident, reminiscent to other examples such as J. F. Christ's bloody sweat, by hiding behind the crucifixion of Jesus or W. C. Pullamantire, by asking to judge the fall of a commonwealth. Marlowe's outstanding dialectic and dialogue abilities enabled him metaphorically in the funeral elegy, either to talk under his second, concealed identity to his first, allegedly murdered, or sacrificed identity. Or, if you like, to address his mournful melancholic thoughts as his second identity, brother John, to himself as his first identity, deceased brother, William. As if there were two separate identities or personalities. The parable of the two brothers, fatally separated, is reminiscent to a Yorkshire tragedy, 1608, by William Shakespeare, which ends with the lines. The brothers, one in bond lies overthrown. This, on a deadlier execution. Listen to an exemplary passage of the funeral elegy, from line 482 to line 502. Look hither then, you that enjoy the youth of your best days, and see how unexpected death can betray your jollity to Ruth. When death you think is least to be respected, the person of this model here set out, had all, that youth and happy days could give him, yet could not all encompass him about. Against the assault of death, who to relieve him, struck home but to the frail and mortal parts, of his humanity, but could not touch his flourishing and fair long-lived deserts, above fate's reach, his singleness was such. So that he dies but once, but doubly lives, once in his proper self then in his name, predestinated time, who all deprives, could never yet deprive him of the same. And had the genius which attended on him been possibility to keep him safe, against the rigour, that hath overgone him, he had been to the public user staff.
if a noble or a wise man, after disfavor of his prince, neglect of his country, forfeiture of his estate, banishment from his friend, imprisonment of his person, or any other esteemed extremes be threatened, with the loss of his head, or execution in any manner. The old poets did fitly feign death to be the child of the night, and sleep to be the sister of death. Wisely including, that as night and sleep wrap up all in stillness, so should death more perfectly finish the course. I lived the subject both of scorn and shame, banished from mirth, of comforts all deprived, horrors with scandal, cares with cares did strive, and ever as I lived, I died alive. Tears in mine eyes, division in my heart, disgrace upon my name, plaints in my breast. Poor and forsaken every day in danger, of wrath and treason, lesser pre than dust, of all abhorred, even to mine own a stranger. No man my friend, in any friend no trust. This entertainments in the world I had, yet for the world exposed myself to all, all more than this though this be all too sad, but here too did my father's will me call.